All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode nine of the Healing Through Mind and Motion podcast, where we explore the relationships of the mind, body, and how we can use those to overcome chronic pain and live a life that we love. I'm your host, Brian Cade, and today we have movement practitioner and movement coach, Bam Lionheart, on the show. Welcome to the show, Bam. Brian, thank you very much for having me. Excited to get into some cool conversation with you. Absolutely. You, you bring a unique blend. You've studied a lot of different systems and some of them, which I believe has a blueprint of how we should move and keep moving throughout a lifetime. Yeah, 100%. So, so with that, just always like to figure out how did you get to the point where you're now a movement coach, you're practicing and working with people to move better? I think like all the, the best things in life, it's a very natural process. Um, movement and movement practices, I've always engaged in some kind of practice, training, or hobby movement since a very, very young age and have kept that alive in myself. Um, now, getting to the point where my experience has culminated to quite a bit of understanding, um, mm -hmm. and it's my absolute pleasure to be able to share my, the understandings and the wisdom that I've been able to gain from different coaches, mentors, and practices to other people who are also um, in this journey of trying to figure out the question of what is the best way to move the body uh, and what can my body do and what is the human body capable of. Mm, beautiful. And just to uh... Since you said the best way to move and you've been searching for that, what are some of the like key things that you believe so far? And I, I believe we can always grow and change. Like, okay, that's what I thought. But what have you come to so far that you're like, this stands out. This has helped me the most when it comes to best movement. Uh, there is a saying I really enjoy. And it says that you can pursue the thing that is right. Like this is the right way to move and you could also pursue uh truth in life this is what is true in life and this is true about movement but you could also pursue uh, that which is beautiful and usually when you pursue something that is beautiful then you stumble upon truth and you stumble upon the right way and when i think about movement and my pursuit of movement which has been very much fueled by both joy and a dissatisfaction with what I was not able to do in terms of capacity. So those two things fueled my diving into understanding and practicing movement from martial arts to weightlifting to calisthenics running, or the whole kind of gambit of things. But it has always been a beautiful process that has both encapsulated the highs, highs emotions of life and the low, lows emotions of life. But throughout that entire thing, this underlying thread of longevity mm -hmm. has been consistent in both of those times. When I feel good and when I don't feel good, I've always wanted to keep the movement alive and stay on the path and keep training, keep practicing, keep uh, communicating with people like yourselves, meeting other people around the world that are part of this process of engaging with their body in a very physical way and experiencing life physically and so when we say what is the best practices well, the best practices is a very subjective thing but on this experience of life i think across the board we can all agree that we want to be able to move mm -hmm. and experience as much movement for as long as we can yeah. and longevity is going to be a very strong compass for if this movement is going to be good, bad, the best, or not the best. And so you have two worlds then that you need to break down when you're going about this examination process. And the first world is going to be the actual thing, environment that you're gonna be doing. These are the external inputs that you're going to be get, whether it's a contact sport and there might mm -hmm. be someone that's going to be hitting you. Um, or it's going to be something like weightlifting, where you're going to be manipulating objects in your environment, or going on a long run, and you're going to be experiencing nature, trails, animals, whatever it is. We have to examine that thoroughly 
then we also have to take a deep examination on the internal environment of our bodies and say, what are the things that make my body tick and allow me to go do these things at whatever environment, at whatever pace, at whatever intens intensity and depth I want to do. So those two worlds um, require a deep examination as we go through this entire process. Yeah, one of the things when we talked before and even now is the uh, your focus on individuality. Like mm -hmm. there's almost never a clear like this is it. It's well, what are you trying to do? Well, how does your body respond in that search inside and then also outside and how things work for that person? Yeah, that's the uh, the ultimate goal is to empower the individual to pursue whatever they want to pursue and to give them the freedom in their body to move however they want to move or to experience life however they want to experience, whether that's a professional athlete who's going to be seeking to perform at the highest level or that's somebody who wants to go out on the town and dance at a club pain free. You know, right. there's the spectrum of movement experiences of, of for the for our human is so wide and so vast. And as a movement coach, someone who is a movement enthusiast, all you can hope is that you give somebody the tools, the understandings and the capacity to pursue whatever road and direction they want to go down. Um, so that's like your ultimate hope. But if you're trying to give that to somebody, you have to come from a baseline of true strength or true health or true grounding for this person. You have to give them the tools to go on this path and empower themselves to continue on this type of thing mm -hmm. that is called the, you know, the path of life. Yeah. And you said giving them the tools a couple of times. And so can you explain what some of those tools are if somebody's has been trying to go dance in the club and they're like, ah, oh, my knees hurt, or um, they're trying to play their sport and they're not able to compete as consistently. What are those, some of those tools people should be looking for? When we're talking about the physical body, it is pain and injury. Those are going to be the big things that people run up against that mm -hmm. take them out of the game, that bring them to the sidelines on the bench, or they can no longer pursue whatever hobby because oh, that makes me hurt, that hurts my knee, or that hurts my back. And so it's a common thing that as we get older, we start closing the door of opportunity. Oh, I just don't, I don't run anymore because my knee hurts, or I can't go do jujitsu because it hurts my back, or I can't go do this because, and you see that, that people are very um, complacent because there is no other narrative that, oh, I just, this thing causes this injury or this pain or this, sensation and I'm getting old so let's just close that door so the easiest way to continue the movement is to make our bodies extremely resilient and durable from injuries and pain which is the precursor to injury your body telling you that hey something isn't isn't right so that when you say okay now as a movement coach I'm trying to reduce pain and injury that's my priority this is my priority it is to protect somebody from excessive pain, chronic pain and getting injured so they get out of the game. You have to know what a pain free and a durable body looks like, moves like, operates like so that when somebody comes into your arena, you can say, OK, this is these are the places where we're not matching. Mm -hmm. And what's different about a movement coach versus a physical therapist or um, a strength coach or a chiropractor is they're looking at somebody with an extremely different lens. Um, and this is a very new field. And movement coaching is, is like new. They're looking at somebody in the quality of movement. And they're looking at the quantity of movement environments and movements that they're doing throughout their day and that they want to do throughout their lifetime. Right now, the physical trainer, the most strength coaches, et cetera, they're looking at the physical body on maybe one or two small planes, like the muscle plane. Oh, the reason you're experiencing pain is because this specific muscle is weak, and so we need to strengthen this. Or let's look at just the, jo the joints. Oh, you have arthritis in your knee, and that's why you're experiencing pain. And these models, these muscle, uh, muscle model, the skeletal, just looking at joint model, 
is has not served us completely has not been able to really address pain and how to make a body uh, resilient and durable so when you have a movement coach who looks at the quality of somebody's movement move it movement encapsulates uh, muscles joints connective tissue bones capillaries blood vessel it encapsulates the entire body as well as whatever the person the yeah. human being is going through experiencing from a whole uh, psychological emotional spiritual whatever movement is the underlying that is us and so when you look at quality of movement it's a very objective and a direct way to affect change within the whole system of the person mm -hmm. And I love that you covered so many parts. Uh, and I, I know you know this, but it's like, it's also like the nervous system and the patterns that somebody's body is naturally going to do. Like, um, I've seen people that's neck are kind of off to the side here. And I'm like, what's going on? I was like, and I asked more questions. And he's like, he's got two monitors. And so all day he's going like this. Oh, wow. And yeah, so he's yeah. like looking at that one and then typing. <laughs> Yeah. And so, yeah, it's like, well, you got a neck issue. We should strengthen that muscle. It's like, but if the pattern doesn't change or the quality of that movement or the repetition, it's like, he's going to keep getting back into that. Yeah. Um, and so I love with movement coaching and I got started with, uh, I'm, I'm sure you you're familiar with the Agassi method. Yeah. Looking at posture alignment is like looking at a much broader picture of how, body sta how somebody stands to each joint position. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you touched on that. You wanted to talk a little bit about foot position and some of those key things like what should somebody, what could somebody start doing so they can start to gain the awareness of how they're moving? Because we find when people come in, they're like, I move great or I have great posture. Or, I do whatever. And then you actually show them. It's like, I had no idea my body was doing that. So how can someone start getting that awareness? I think what you said is the biggest, which is you show somebody a framework or a model of movement and they're like, oh, my body actually does not match that framework or model. The most empowering thing that any individual can do is decide for themselves how the human body should move. And I'm not saying how it should lift weights or how it should perform exercises. We're very good at saying this is how you should move within exercises. I'm saying how your body should move 24-7, 365, how you should walk, how you should bend down, how you should squat down, how you should do the simplest of tasks. And you should have that question in your brain. How does and how should the body move and how does my body move? and constantly challenge this mental framework that you have and your own body's capabilities and movement qualities. The framework that has been proposed to us is um, extremely debilitating and non-empowering. It is a linear framework that has looked at angular motion, um, the rotation aspects and the, cap the capabilities of joint angles and and it said, well, here's the, all, all the list of all the angles of the joint and what the joints can do. And that's how the body moves. We've described mm -hmm. movement as just simply like, oh, I, if I know that the elbow does this and the shoulder does this, I understand movement. But how does that translate to you opening the cupboard and grabbing uh, some whatever it is out of the cupboard and bringing it down? Like, are you going to map out all each and every joint and each and every muscle activation to do simple tasks like grabbing something out of a cupboard or reaching down to pick up the garbage or mm. you know brushing your teeth going on a, on a walk with the dog these basic movements we have to be uh, so aware of and also they have to fit within a framework an easily digestible framework that we can cognitively look at so mm. that when we're going through our daily life we can make better decisions that's the ultimate goal i want to make better decisions in my movement capacity and uh, this conversation is so brand new to it's fringe when you're talking about yeah. people's awareness it's just like when people started talking about diet and before we knew that there was foods that were better for the body or worse for the body 
um, healing for the body or damaging for the body. We just did whatever we wanted. We ate whatever we wanted. We ate what felt good. And then we started to formulate some kind of model or framework of what a healthy eating behavior called diet looks like. And from that model, we can then make good decisions. I'm going to eat this or I'm not going to eat this or I'm going to choose to eat this even though I'm aware that it's probably not quote unquote healthy for my body, but I'm consciously making this choice. So these models that we create empower us to make choices, better decisions that serve ourselves and serve our life. And right now, the framework that we have for how movement is and is performed in the body is like so sub level and is not serving us on a, on a greater level. So it's one of my big missions is trying to simplify and bring this model that I've been able to comprehend and digest and embody in my movement to the everyday person in a very simple and concrete package so that people can start to make better decisions for themselves. Yeah, and that's one of the things I appreciate. Like if anyone watching, definitely check out Bam's uh, Instagram and we'll talk, we'll get put the links in later, but you break down like this is the walk, this is the crawl, this is the squat, this is the hinge. And you do a great job of simplifying it. And even yeah. like simple things to get out of back pain, like uh, the one video where you're showing all the ways to lay and use your couch that aren't normal, <laughs> uh, which was funny. Yeah. Um, it, so we're starting, or at least people that are like myself that are looking at a variety of systems, diet and getting a healthy blueprint was great. And there's also this like fear now of like, what do I eat? Carbs are bad. Fat's bad. Protein's bad. Don't eat food ever. You should fast only. <laughs> um, and so the more I'm studying different systems, one person is saying a deep squat is great for you. Another one's like, never do it. You're going to make your joints too lax. Um, you're going to get hypermobility. And in some ways, it's almost like, okay, what I was doing hurt. What do I do next? Um, and I guess if you could talk a little bit about the systems and the blueprints um, and that polarity, because I like that your job is to empower somebody to learn for themselves because it is getting to the point where it's like, Squats are great, and they're going to kill you. <laughs> yeah, it's, get, it's getting uh, it's getting yeah. pretty he hectic out in the in the social media and information overload load world. If you do take uh, examine the environment right now, in the diet culture, in fitness movement culture, in the political culture, what you will see is the divisive. This is good, and this is bad, mm -hmm. and that it that polarizing this is good this is bad does not paint the whole picture of the gray zone that is life because life is never on these extremes of good or bad so whenever we see information we want to have a really good kind of process a filtering process that says why is this information said the way it is what can i learn about this instead of taking it at face value say why would somebody say this um, it's probably the most important thing is to have discernment when we are navigating this. When you are building your framework of how the body moves, to have really good discernment for why is somebody saying this? Um, how does this get into my life and how does this affect me? For instance, somebody might say carbohydrates are bad. Don't eat carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. You want to say, okay, why is this person saying this? They're trying to get people to health whatever, then I got to look at my life and say, where do I have carbohydrates in my life? Okay, here are the places where I eat carbohydrates. Are there any places where I eat carbohydrates where I'm um, outside of awareness, where I don't know I'm, I'm eating them, or are they intentional? Okay, here's the intentional ways that I'm introducing carbohydrates. What if I do listen to this person and say carbohydrates are bad, and I take the carbohydrates out of my input system, out of my diet, then what happens? You do that for a couple of days or you do that for a week and you will get a direct result. This direct result is going to be a, a nugget of truth, a golden wisdom and something that no science paper, no expert or no person can tell you otherwise because you've had a di direct experience that when I cut carbohydrates out, 
I felt amazing and I was able to function at a higher level and pursue the things that I want to do really well. Or I cut carbohydrates out and I felt X, Y, and Z. I felt sluggish. I felt this. I felt that. Um, so you do this process in science, the N equals one process, which is, okay, I'm getting all this information. I put it through my filter and then I go about enacting that in my daily life and I get a direct result from that instead of taking the science instead of taking this expert's opinion and then just saying that just is what it is i actually have to do the, the dirty work and see how i respond to this and if it fits in my life you know somebody somebody might say carbohydrates make me feel um bad sluggish um, i don't like carbohydrates but then i notice whenever i go out to eat with my friends that it's hard for me to to not eat carbohydrates so I'm going to choose to have carbohydrates here and here. So you can start to have some discernment around this. When we go back to the movement conversation, it's very much the same thing. Your physical body is going to be the biggest uh, tell of whether something should be in your movement wheelhouse or shouldn't. And it will always tell you the truth. It's not going to lie to you. Unless your body is in a big pain cave and you are bound up with a mount, like a crazy amount of tension, if you are a normal person with pretty good athletic function, normal human function, when you give your, your body an input, your body will give you a direct communication of this is good for me or this is not good for me. Yeah, I love, I love the focus on testing. Um, I have a, we have a intern, uh, personal trainer, uh, and he's like, Hey, what do you think about this, this, and this? It's like, I have my thoughts on what's going to happen, but it's like, if you try it, let me know how it goes. And so he's getting direct. He's like, it was great for two days. And then day three, it was like, it fell apart yeah. or, ah, oh, it worked really well. Every time I add it, I feel better. And it's like such an individualized process where we're learning and taking that self-responsibility of like, oh, I feel better when I do this or not. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned, and I'd be curious, the idea of like, if you're somebody that moves well and you're not in the pain cave, you're going to get good feedback on what good movement is. Um, and I know for myself, there's things that I used to do that when I did it, I get pain. But now as my body's been rehabilitated or moving better, I can now do it and it feels good. So along with that testing, what's kind of your thought process on that? And how does somebody get what one day, even just like the idea of crawling, a rocker could be good one day or moving too much could be too much, but a small movement could be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the framework model, when we're developing this this framework of movement and what how my body should move there's also the question of what my body should be able to do mm -hmm. this is what i believe is missing across the board is the north star the golden compass for who we are as human beings what is the human animal and how should it operate and how should it move and what are the capacities that it should have fundamentally like when you look at a tiger or you look at a cheetah like you can list the physical qualities the traits the movement capacities that this specific animal has when you look at a gorilla you can list those things out because they're patternable you can see them repeat themselves over and over and over again an elephant a fish it doesn't matter what it is there's very specific qualities of that we have this we don't really want to label ourselves as an animal, but we for right. sure are a species. Mm -hmm. And just like a gorilla, just like a cheetah, we have a physical list of general capacities and traits that are consistent no matter where you are on the globe. And these golden traits, these physical qualities are the grounding point that keeps us human and in our animal body. If a cheetah tried to be an elephant, you can ex you, you bet that that cheetah is going to have back pain. He's going to yeah. blow out a knee. It's going to be like hard for that cheetah to be an elephant. If an elephant tries to run as fast as he can like a cheetah, 
elephant's not going to do so good. So we have to honor who we are as human beings. And um, the best way that we can do that is by listing out these physical qualities and traits to get into the nitty gritty of that. Uh, when we look at, at the at the human animal, uh, our primary function as homo sapiens humans is the ability to navigate through our environment, mm. ability to go from point A to point B. We were hunter gatherers, nomadic across the lands of the earth. We we're able to travel with hunting seasons, with weather, to gather this, to gather that, and even today, our ability to locomote through our environment whether it's walking, running, driving a car, airplane, train, is what makes us like able to live such big and fruitful lives. Mm -hmm. So the foundation of who we are and the primary focus of the mind-body connection is our ability to locomote. And the way that the human body, the way that the, the human as an animal, the human animal locomotes is walking. And then you have walking turns into running, and the, the precursor to walking is crawling. So walking is really the foundation of our movement capacity. Mm -hmm. What's beautiful about walking, the foundation of our life, is that it is also the pinnacle of our movement capacity. But if you take an athlete or strength conditioning coaches or whatever, that's like, they hear you like, walking's boring. What are you talking about? Like, no, 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 no. But if you actually broke down the very technical, extremely advanced hierarchical, hierarchical organization that needs to happen within a human body so that it could be on two points, two pivot points, two feet, and locomote through its environment, bipedal walking. It's insanely complex, and it took us millions of years to be able to evolve into a body that could do this. And we do it really, really, really well, like insanely well, better than anyone um on the planet like we don't you don't see cows on two feet walking if we see a dog doing it it's cute you pull out your phone and you videotape it and you share it so that is a huge a humongous realization that i hope many people have is that my life is completely founded on my ability to walk yeah. and if i cannot walk then i am only a couple steps away from death yeah. And if and if walking is the foundation of my life, I need to preserve that ability as much as I can. I want that ability to be robust, to be strong, and I want to have that as long as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. This is hard for us to grasp because we are in such a small bubble of experience and what we see especially on social media is from a very specific, you know, you're looking at maybe toddlers from parents who share their toddlers on social media to like 40, 50, maybe 60 ish. But the elderly population who are not present on social media, who don't have a voice, who aren't being showcased, who most of them are going to be in care homes or in some other dark places that we don't know, they aren't able to give us this big insight, which is when you stop walking, your health dramatically declines. Mm -hmm. I had the uh, great honor and experience to be an emergency responder for four years on the ambulance. And I would see all kinds of people on these 911 calls. I would have experiences where I was picking somebody up who was 50, mid 50s, and looked like they were 80, 90. And this person, most of the time, almost all the time, was bedridden and unable to locomote themselves. They were non-ambulatory is what we call them, non-ambulatory. Somebody has to grab them and move them. And this person, you could just see the life slowly falling from their body. And then I would have calls with an 80 or even a 90 year old person. And I would just ask them like, what is your life like? What do you do? How do you stay healthy? And most all the time they're like, I go on a walk in the morning, yeah. I walk. And they keep their walking alive. And it's like, wow, you look phenomenal. You look like you're in your like, late 60s like early 70s and then i had this this interaction with this other person who looked like they're on death's door and there are so many different variables but the biggest common variable was the ability to move especially the ability to walk um, that kept us healthy alive and thriving 
Yeah, you covered a lot of great stuff there. And I appreciate the focus on walking. And I also just acknowledge the, it's amazing, over 50, people look so different. You Like you said, you can have a 55-year-old that looks 90, and you can have a 90-year-old that, like I've seen a 92-year-old do downward dog better than just about any client I have. I'm like, what, holy, like, amazing. And he's a walker. He would... Mm -hmm. Never did crazy exercise, but he would go hunting and he'd go out walking. Like he walked all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and just from my own life, there was a point I was trying to lift weights and like light weights because I was getting migraines all the time. And I had the realization I'm like, if I walk a half mile, I feel like I'm falling apart. I should probably just get good at walking. Yeah. <laughs> and when I let go of trying to do anything other than get good at walking, I got to the point where I could do three, uh, like a mile, then a mile twice a day, and it slowly built up. And clients ask me sometimes, like, what do you believe like is good exercise? Because we were running mostly a fitness center. And I'm like, I think do your corrective exercise work, whether it's a menu from like a Goscu or groundwork from Goda or a combination of whatever makes you feel good, and then go walk twice mm -hmm. a day. Yeah. <laughs> you would feel so much better. You'd feel stronger, but we don't value it in the same way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, yeah, we we have a, our values are a little bit mismatched right now. Yeah. And we're not really honest about what we do value. And the people that are talk are doing uh, exercise and fitness aren't always honest too about what they value. Mm -hmm. It's a very muddled world and what who I'm concerned about is the next generations who's coming through who is born in a society where movement is something that is hard to come by. You know, we're put in shoes or put in chairs at an early age. So when they do come to an age and they do try to engage with movement, who do they, how do they do that? You know, we have our sports uh, world, which is a great outlet for them, but it can over specialize them at an early age. And then they're taught to, you know, look up to these high level uh, athletes and perform at the highest level. So they get stuck in a competitive and specialization, which is not good for the human body. Over specialization is, is a very easy way to kind of get things a, a little bit uh, helter skelter or out of whack, out of balance in one way. And then you've got fitness and exercise and then you go look at the fitness and exercise world and you got all these people and they're uh, really just muscle madness is going on everyone's crazy yeah. about the muscles and the aesthetics and they're looking at this and the people that do have all the muscles are saying look at me I look so beautiful I look so healthy and this is what you should be doing but if we look at their lifestyle if we look at their mentality and their psychology a lot of times it's not healthy. A lot of times there's a humongous sacrifice and toll on the physical body to look a certain way or to lift a certain amount of weight. Look at me and look how strong I am. But no one's talking about the sacrifices that they have to make to be able to lift certain amount of weights, to be able to look a certain way. And so the, the next generation is coming in is saying, oh, look at these people with success. Look at these high level athletes. Look at these people who are massive bulging muscles like I want to feel what that feels like, but they have no comprehension of the sacrifices that are going to be needed to achieve that. And so in the search for just general human capacity to move and be a human, in the search for general human health and robustness to live a full life, you can see that you're automatically pulled to extremes, weightlifting, bodybuilding, you know, extreme competitive sports, there's not this underlying middle ground that is saying, this is what we should keep alive. The, the human's uh, body should be able to do these things. And here's how you can go about doing that. You kind of get pulled down these rabbit holes, down uh, hobbyist, bodybuilding, competitive sports playing, whatever it is. And you either take it down the rabbit hole and you find out that, you know, whenever that that path ends for you. And then you got to sort of navigate your way back to homeostasis, a place when you're like, I, okay, this is what it takes for me to just be a normal, a normal person. And it's almost demonized to just be a normal person. But the normal human body is capable of amazing things. 
insanely cool things, yeah. but we just don't frame it. We don't romanticize the the human body's ability. We romanticize, obviously, you know, the game winning one handed catch touchdown. We romanticize the person with like humongous muscles, the person who can just lift all the weights that they want. You romanticize all of that. The normal everyday person who can live from zero to 100 pain free, no injuries gets no attention and no limelight, yeah. but that's who we need to start to bring yeah. our focus and attention to. Yeah, you give, like, there's so many pieces that I want to cover, um, just even in that. So I want to rewind for a bit, uh, just to the idea of walking. Because if there's a way we should walk, could you talk, like, there's a blueprint for how we should walk. Could you go mm -hmm. over, if somebody's like, I want to get good at walking, I want to own that. How should somebody walk? Uh, number one, the only way to get good at something is to do it. So mm -hmm. number one is develop a practice. Every day I'm going to go on a little walk. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, in the, in the morning would be a great time. So first and foremost, we have to develop a practice. And then after we develop practice, we got to examine the, the world of walking. We say, who are the best walkers? Where does walking come from? So the, the external environment. You want to look at the uh, hunter-gatherers and the indigenous people and the people that live a lifestyle where they're walking and look at how they're walking. And what you're going to see is that they have a very different body structure and posture than everyday people now. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like very, some very simple things. I've kind of been doing this whole circle and have come back to this understand of walking. How should somebody walk? Number one, you have to have good feet. Your feet are your foundation of who you are. You got to know how your foot works and how it's going to hold the rest of your body. If your foot isn't strong, it's going to be very difficult for your body to organize itself on top of a faulty foundation of a foot. So you need strong feet. Figure out what a good and strong, healthy foot is. Most of the time we know it's not going to be pancake feet, collapsed, over pronated uh, arches. It's not going to be that. No. Um, once you have an understanding of the feet and just how your feet can move better, then you got to know how do I propel myself forward? How do I actually make this thing go forward? The model that's uh, given to us right now is, is linear, is that we just come up, we strike the ground with our heel, and then we just propel ourselves back with triple extension. It's just like this very linear model. But if you look at, at walking, mm -hmm. it is, is not linear. It's in uh, spiral mechanics, just like all other movements that the human body does. It, and the walking forward goes from an out to in energy, just like a punch does, just mm -hmm. like a wave does, um, just like anything in nature. We walk and we have the strength of the outside of our body and we use out to in propulsion to move us forward. Yeah. And that out to in propulsion, where does that come from? It primarily comes from the backside of our body. So we're using the big muscles, the big tissues, the big fascial lines on the backside of our body, mostly to propel us forward, uh, dominant that way. Um, basically, you when, you, when you're walking, yeah, when you're walking, you want to have strong feet that don't collapse and you want to feel your glutes. Yeah. If you can feel, if you can feel your glutes, then you're going to be pretty good to go. Let's say we take a walk. Can you see my whole body? Uh, everything up to your uh, hat right there. Okay, so if we take a step forward, I need to load myself completely on my right foot. So mm -hmm. if my right foot, if that house is collapsing, it's going to be really difficult. So the first thing is I got to find the strength of my right foot. And the mm -hmm. strength of that right foot is going to come when we're walking. We talk about this lower navicular bone. You want to find this spot. We don't want to be loading on the big toe, right? On that navicular bone, it's going to wash like away from the outside to the yeah. last toe. We find that. Once you find your foot, then you find your hip. You find your glute. You find big pressure on the backside. A big no-no is taking a step and feeling the quad and hip flexor when you load. Mm -hmm. We want to receive the pressure from the glute and the outside of our foot. And then we need to balance ourselves, and that balance happens when I take my head and my entire spine and I do this little offset. Yeah. So I have to have a spine that kind of moves and loads into one side so I can balance on one side. Load on a strong foot, load on a strong glute, take a step forward, 
load on a strong foot, load on a strong backside. My head floats into that side, and I've got this. Nice. So when we're walking, somebody's like, okay, how do I walk? We just want to feel the strength of our backside in each step taking us forward. Best thing you can do to learn how to walk is to find somebody who walks and walks really well, like a coach, and say, show me. Show me, how I, show, show me how I can do this. One thing that I will say about walking is that the only way to get good at walking is to walk. And it's important to note that walking happens on an east to west horizontal. We're propelling ourselves on this horizontal line. But most of the fitness and exercise world is done on this vertical line where we're strengthening ourselves going up and down, up and down, up and down up and down. So if you go to walk and you're having trouble, most of the time it's because we've been living in this vertical axis and we haven't recentered ourselves on this east to west horizon line of propelling ourselves laterally over long distances. Awesome. Thank you for demoing that. And yes, I highly recommend if you're wanting to learn to walk better, find a movement coach, find someone that's a movement specialist that knows some of these principles because yeah when i first learned about it it's like completely shifted way i saw movement because i was very much i was exercise science and it's like this linear path and now i can't unsee it it's like yeah when you see it move someone move well it's like that's it like yeah that's exactly it and so um thank you for sharing that and i also love that you are constantly in different sitting positions that like we as kids would have had and it's amazing what just doing what you're doing, um, how it changes the body and how things adjust. Yeah, we had it when we were young. You know, yeah. that was a, that's another thing that's extremely important to know about this is that one of the most technical movements that we see in the animal kingdom, bipedal walking, mm -hmm. being on two points and, and being able to walk that just about every single human on the face of this earth taught themselves how to do this without language, without somebody mm -hmm. else telling them to put your hand here, to put your foot here. So there's this very strong communication that we have with ourselves and our nervous system to be able to orient our internal landscape, the pressures, the tensions, and to orient ourselves time in time and space and gravity and say like, how do I function this body so that I can move about my environment really well? That communication, that relationship that we have with our body and our body's ability to sense where we are in time and space and in gravity is always with us. It's always there. It's unfortunate, though, that we are prioritizing rational thinking and language-based learning. So this kinesthetic awareness, this sensory-based communication, oftentimes as we go through school, does not get exposure does not get time to develop like it would if we were out in nature or if we were spending time moving our body climbing things and doing all types of different movements so a lot of times this big epidemic that we have of chronic pain of people having this sensation of a disconnect with their body is because from age six to 20 something if you go to college from age six to 20 something you are um, almost promoted or it's almost better for your lifestyle to reduce the amount of movement that you have sit in the chair put your head down and look in a book and study and really make this part of your brain this frontal yeah. lobe super strong and dominant and the whispers of your body and this sensational kind of understanding of who we are and our place in the world which got you from lying on your back to being able to stand up walk and run that is kind of just dismissed and put in the in the back burner and so then you become 20 late 20s early 30s and pain or maybe injury starts to crop up and you have this question of like what's going on I used to have it so good when I was a kid, and now something went awry. It's because this path that was set out for us just instinctively and by birthright, our ability to be with our nervous system and our body at all times was kind of blocked 
and mm -hmm. taken over by this need to dominate this rational thinking and really understand language, mathematics, and our ability to perceive with our brain instead of to feel with our body. Yeah. And like you said, in school, it's like it's encouraged not to move. Like if you're moving too much, it's like you got like anxiety or ADHD. And I believe there's cases that there is something going on. But I think a lot of it is just you're told don't move and your body's telling you you need to move and we're, we're trying to ignore it. It's like the body's trying to talk and that's like, oh, you're just anxious. It's like, right. no, you need movement. <laughs> like go run. Yeah. 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 Um, and I also just the note for anyone listening, just the reminder of the children do all of these things naturally. They naturally sit on the floor and they're in like 25 different sitting positions that just if you think about the hip mobility and the control you need to do that, or even for the, uh, I believe it says that you're doing now, the amount of knee flexion you need that we lose over time because we don't sit like this. Um, so just to pay attention to the indigenous cultures that still move from birth to till the time they're done and then children. Um, it's powerful stuff. I wanted to go back because like I said, there's that period that I'm like, I got like six directions I wanted to go. Um, you talk about like we glorify the bodybuilders and the obstacle course races and Ninja Warrior and all of these like, uh, like extremes. And what I don't think is talked about enough is like most people don't either we don't acknowledge it or we're told it's normal to have all these injuries. Like I know a ton of people in their 20s, early 20s, who are doing obstacle course races like, oh, I had this elbow issue from monkey bars or my knee, my, I tear my foot every time. And it's like it's almost as if we expect to hurt when we go walk through nature or run through nature and do an obstacle mm -hmm. course. And you talked about it earlier in that connection to where should be durable and resilient. Like if every time we did a race in nature to, and that race was called hunting and gathering to get our next meal, we hurt, we wouldn't have lived very long. So I guess, could you elaborate a little bit on that kind of concept or that notion of what we're doing with pain and what's normal versus what's expected? Yeah, there's a, right now, we have the most athletic people that the human race has ever seen, doing some of the wildest, fastest, strongest things uh, that we've ever seen. So we have some of the highest performing athletes in their specialty. Yeah. We have some of the, if you're just looking at aesthetics, some of the hum biggest largest humans like if you would have taken an Arnold Schwarzenegger or a Frank Zane and put them in the 16th century or yeah. you know before people would be looking at it like you're an alien like this is absolutely insane it would have been it would have been actually hilarious to see but yeah. so we are the biggest we are the most performing we are right now we have the most amount of global gyms and fitness and exercise culture that we've ever seen before and we also have the highest rate of chronic pain and injuries and uh, corrective surgeries that we've ever seen before. So it's very interesting to navigate this, that we have these two big things that are coming on, which is we have such big perf high performers, such big uh, physically big people, and then we also have the most amount of chronic pain, the most amount of injuries, the most amount of surgeries that are being done than ever before in mm -hmm. ever. And that is a, what is told is just normal. Yeah. It's normal to have back pain. How many people have heard, oh, just wait until you're 30. Ugh, your body just starts to break down when you say, oh, just wait until you're 40. Yeah. Oh, this old age is, I'm getting a little creaky. I'm getting a little in, in my bones. And I think that is because we, uh, as individuals and as a race, are easy to forget. It's very easy to uh, forget who we are, where we came from, and, and what we are supposed to do. And when we're pres like, how fast did iPhones come out until everyone had an iPhone that it was just normal to have an iPhone? Yeah. But then if you look, you know, not even what 30 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, it's like 
people didn't just have a phone all the time. So when there's like a, a new trend that happens, all of a sudden, when it becomes widespread, it's adopted as normal and okay. Yeah. But just because it is common or, or every day does not mean that it is normal. So it takes someone having to go outside of themselves, outside of the realm of what is happening now in history and say like, whoa, this is actually crazy. And many yeah. people have probably had that experience when you're going out to a restaurant or you're out and you're watching people just be people and you're like, everybody's in their phone right now. Like, yeah. whoa, what's happening? But because life is transient and we understand it backwards and we're trying to just live forward, forward, forward lives, uh, it's hard to take yourself outside of your life and see a global perspective mm -hmm. of, whoa, my, my aunt is having hip surgery and then my friend had his knee hurt and then my dad's back hurting and then my, you know, it's like, why is everybody hurting? And then if you ask a couple of questions and if you do look at the studies, you're like, whoa, this is happening astonishingly, astonishingly yeah. at higher and higher and, and more exponential rates. It's going to get to the point uh, Brian, when there will be a time when when everyone collectively says, "Pump the brakes, what's going on?" But we yeah. haven't we haven't gotten there yet. So everyone's like, "It's fine, it's fine, it, it's okay." Yeah, and even the idea of surgery, like uh, we were, I was at a conference and they talked about a laminectomy, and it's like the idea that like your body needs stuff cut out of it to function, like or that you need to like replace something or you need this extra support for your body or so i get traumatic accidents and stuff like that like if your bones are crushed you might need a little bit more so please see a surgeon but the idea that surgery is the go-to it's like 200 years ago if we needed surgery for our knees or hips or backs every time like we got to 30 like yeah just the idea that it couldn't have been normal to function that way yeah and so yeah just this is where yeah. this 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 is where the the profession of the movement coach is going to be a a humongous puzzle piece in this. Yeah. Where either it's a specific movement coach or it's where the strength conditioning trainers, the doctors, the physical therapists are going to actually start to pay attention to movement qualities and how it relates to what's going on. Yeah. And maybe we're like, well, we already look at movement quality, but it's like it's so infantile in its understanding of what we have yeah. going on right now. So it's going to, the, this is where the, the profession, the movement coach is going to start to blast off. It's unfortunate now because this message of durable yeah. life and being pain free is muddled right now because then you've got all these different theories around human movement or how it should be done or how it should be trained or how it should be attained. So even if you are somebody who comes to the realization that, hey, I've got back pain and it's not okay, it's not, it should not be okay that I wake up with back pain and I've been doing that for year after year, I suddenly wake up and I say, I've been tolerating this and now I, this should not be part of my experience. And that's where I'm at. It's like, there's no reason that you should be experiencing chronic pain or back pain. There's no good reason why you shouldn't get out of bed, feel really good, be able to go run three miles, be able to do your daily activities, go on a car ride, go to the gym, hang out with your friends and feel phenomenal in your physical body. There's no reason that every single person should not have that capability. But if you are somebody that comes to the realization that, hey, I can't, like you were saying, I can't walk without being in pain, yeah. then you have to like go into this world of doing self-research and navigating because there has not yet been a collective understanding and agreement on how the human body should move right now. And yeah. as soon as that really comes to fruition, then a lot of good things are going to happen. Just like with the diet world, like we need to come to a collective understanding on just the base general principles on diet, the things that we need to survive and the things that don't help us survive. We don't need excess sugar. We don't need uh, processed this. We don't need these specific things in our diet. And do we do need protein? We do need a certain amount of carbohydrates. And there's like this general overview 
of mm -hmm. what it takes to be a healthy eater. And there's a general overview that we need to come to as fast as possible on what it means to be a healthy mover. And it's not what it means to be a healthy athlete or a healthy lifter or a healthy whatever. It's a healthy human being and how a healthy human being should move right now. Uh, yeah. and that, that understanding needs to happen ASAP in the collective consciousness. I thousand percent agree. And it's like, yeah, this should be normal that people are learning to move or reclaiming that ability to move. Um, what We're almost out of time. I wanted to, this is a question I wanted to learn a little bit more because I thought it was humorous. We talked about a, a week last week and I asked, you said kind of like a bad diet or a balanced diet. You can eat healthy, have a little bit of something that's not optimal. And so I brought up lifting. I was like, the idea that you could focus on good movement and then add some lifting. And I asked you, I'm like, so can you get away with deadlifting and Olympic lifting? You're like, no, I feel terrible every time I do it. Yeah. So I wanted to hit like, what does lifting look like for you? And what are some of the key things like that keeps you lifting, but also moving well in that? The, uh, I used to, uh, was really big into CrossFit, was really big into competitive Olympic weightlifting and moving a bunch of weight as like as fast as I could or as much weight as I possibly could. Yeah. But I never once was in a CrossFit gym or doing Olympic weightlifting and said, this is really healthy for my body. Hmm. I did it because it brought me a sense of joy. It was a challenge. It was something I could like put my, my, my whole body, my whole mind body into and focus, you know, distract myself from life and just like attack something mm -hmm. so it was very good in that regard but now as i've come to have this framework and have this understanding of how the human body should move and have really dialed in and reconnected with my body and prioritized longevity prioritize the health of my joints connective tissue my muscles all of that i get a very strong input when i do something that my body doesn't want to do, such as lifting weights from the ground, especially with a barbell. Mm. So I do not lift heavy weights from the ground, um, especially I do not touch a barbell. I, I believe that the barbell is one of the most unnatural ways that you could in, you know, do fitness or exercise with the body. I, I love 10 pound dumbbells. I love 10 pound dumbbells or a, a weight vest. I love mm -hmm. keeping weight inside my center of gravity and um, doing high volume, high repetition for the, for the purpose of binding my joints together in a very specific torque, in a very specific rotation that makes me feel stronger and more durable. I never grab a dumbbell and say, I'm going to work out X muscle because that's not how the body works. The body only understands movement. It does not understand the muscles that we've you know, coined and mapped out. Body has no idea of that. So when I grab a dumbbell, let's say, I feel and picture this whole mapping of a tension line in my body. And I either need to wring it like a sponge out so that I can gain some more length or tension or neurological function of something, or so I can um, lengthen it out and really get some like mm -hmm. elasticity with it, with some type of strength. So it always has a, a sensory based type of thing. It's very like lightweight. It's, uh, it's a big joy of mine to be doing some 10 pound dumbbell work and be like beads of sweat are just dripping from my brain. Cause right now everyone is so focused on how much can you lift or how much can you move? Um, the last point about lifting is, uh, when you do come to the realization of what, okay, the primary focus of the human body is walking and walking is done primarily in the split stance from, mm -hmm. you know, right to left side. So I'm not, I'm not using two feet like a frog to go forward. I'm using my right side and then I'm using my left side. Um, and when I do that, when I land on my right side, everything goes from the outside in. There's this internal torque, internal rotation that happens at the femur level when I go into triple extension or when my hip extends or when I go to push off that foot. So you say, okay, I've got this idea that I, my body usually works in lefts and rights and diagonals and spirals. 
and then it goes from out to in when I do that. So then you go and you approach a barbell and you say, okay, what is this movement and what is it demanding of my body? Well, it's demanding me to put my feet heels down and flat on the ground. Okay, well, already that's not how I walk and how I go about 90% of my day. Okay, so I'm going to be flat footed. What else is it asking me to do? It's asking me to use both of my hands. Okay, the times in my life when I use both of my hands to manipulate objects or to open a door or anything, that's very rare too. Yeah. And now it's telling me to lift this thing from the ground all the way up to my hips. Well, if you look at a deadlift almost across the board with somebody, when you're pulling the bar up, you see the kneecaps go wide. So when I'm extending my hips, when I'm going to propel myself up or forward, I'm driving everything wide. And if I was to take that same external torque, external pattern that's going to be programmed in the deadlift into my walk, I'm going to be going against the grain of the way that I'm supposed to be walking. I'm going to be, feel like I'm swimming backwards as I'm trying to walk forward. It's going to make my walk not only feel very difficult, but I'm going against the grain of my tissue which then, oh, now the front of my hips are tight. Now my knee's bugging me. Now my low back is feeling tight. It's because we're not moving in the, in the energy, the way that the energy is supposed to be conducted. And so then you, then you do a couple deadlifts, you have this understanding, and you say, why do I want to deadlift? Why do I want to pick up this weight? What about this is important to me? Why do I find myself doing this? And how is this helping me live my life better? Are you a competitive power lifter? and that's what you really want to do, okay, makes sense. But if you're a person coming to the gym and you are chasing, let's say, you're trying to be a more durable human, you need to look at these things like, does this actually make me more durable? Um, and people are like, well, deadlifting helps with, you know, like being able to like lift objects or whatever. Well, okay, if that's, if that's the truth, like I've done a lot of manual labor in my life, uh, especially I was doing, I was a, an arborist for a time doing tree work. Mm. So climbing trees, cutting down trees, using chainsaws. And sometimes I would have to pick up multiple stumps of wood, 100 to 200 plus pounds and move them around. So it was like a big deadlift. But the difference between a deadlift where the weight is outside of your body and a big stump it cannot be more different. Like your body yeah. mechanics and the movement of lifting an object that is going to be inside your center of, of mass versus a very tiny barbell that puts its weight way outside of your mass is going to be um, super damaging to the body because it's going to make you force you uh, to move in some unnatural ways. Like a, a a squat with a sandbag or an atlas stone, it's going to be the almost a different, like completely different than a barbell squat or a barbell deadlift. So you have to look at the exercise and what it's doing to your internal landscape, and if that matches the framework you have around what a healthy body, how it should move, not just oh, I think that humans should be able to deadlift two times their body weight and and you know these arbitrary numbers that we come up with. Yeah, and I appreciate you going into that. And I'm laughing because I used to be like, yeah, I think any guy, if they put in the energy, could deadlift 315. And that was earlier in my career. And now I'm like, I don't know if anyone should deadlift because if you ever needed to pick something up, you didn't do it for 10 reps or five reps. You would pick it up and then move it somewhere. And so you pick it up and then you start walking with it. And you mm -hmm. might put it on your shoulder, but then you lean forward. And so, yeah, like, my view of those lifts completely have changed. And I do believe in many ways people are damaging themselves lifting like that. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a big science experiment that we're going through right now because yeah. this is the, the first time that we've had uh, a very sedentary life with technology and easy lives. And so we, we have to answer the question, how do we make strong humans? And we're yeah. trying to answer that right now. Um, and we've kind of stopped at the modern fitness model and exercise model. And we're like, got it. It's good. Barbells and dumbbells. Like, it's good. It's doing mm -hmm. good things for us. Um, and my hope is that everyone in that 
space and in that field uh, could also rally around how do I make strong humans, strong humans that are durable humans for a mm -hmm. lifetime and how, yeah. what does that actually look like instead of um, a very just like, yep, yeah, this is what we do. The barbells are, but barbells have like only been around for a like couple 60, hundred years. Yeah, yeah. Not, not even like it's like. Yeah, yeah. They got popularized they, in like the 70s and right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, almost out of time. Um, is there anything that you wish we would have covered or that you feel like you, you just have on your heart that you want to say um, before we wrap up? Um, yes. If you are somebody who is looking to understand the human body and human movement, the best thing that you can do is look for people who have been in the game for the longest people who are actually moving their body and practicing what they preach mm -hmm. and people who have been moving and who have been pretty healthy for a very long time. Those are the people that you want to reach out to and be like, what do you do? What do you think about movement? How do you train? How does your body feel? How do I avoid injury? These are the people that really we want to seek out for. It's um, easy to find a brand or a movement system with some flashy marketing and some rationality as to why you should do something. But even within those movement systems or those brands or those uh, sectors, whatever it is that you uh, find yourself in, find the person who's been doing that the longest or the one who, who embodies that and start to look and examine that person. Does this person live and breathe a lifestyle that I would like? Do they embody health? Do they embody strength? Do they embody these different things? Look for those people and you'll go from mentor to coach and you'll find people that are going to give you actual uh, applicable understandings, which is the biggest thing that you can have right now. It's because the way that we learn, it's very easy for us to trick ourselves that, that uh, rational understanding and understanding something about the body is actually going to be able to apply it to myself. But there's a whole uh, process that needs to happen when you first understand something to it actually knowing it in your body. And so you want to find the people that are living, breathing examples of knowing and work with them as closely and as fast as possible instead mm -hmm. of go the route of let me just read this book let me just listen to this ted talk or let me just listen to this like find the people that are doing um, and they will they're going to tell you some truths some some deep truths yeah it's amazing how much we, we undervalue finding the people that are living the outcome that we want and asking them like how are you doing it it's like because, yeah, movement's very new, and uh, you won't see many lifters in their 80s and 90s who feel amazing. Uh, um, so, yeah, seeking out those that are, like, have done it, lived it, and they're, like, 60, 70, 80, and they're, like, I feel amazing. You're, like, what are they doing? Um, I love showing a clip. There's a, I think it's Lu Zijan. Uh, he was a Qigong master, and he's like 116 and he's showing this form. You can look him up on YouTube and I'll actually put that in there. And he's 116 years old, just smooth, controlled and beautiful. And he moves better than like just about any 40 year old that I know. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's perfect. Um, so I really, you've given so much information. I love the, you definitely don't go surface level on anything. And I can tell you put a lot of thought and understanding and practice, like an embodied knowing of this stuff. And I really appreciate that. So I appreciate having you on the show. If somebody wanted to seek you out, learn more, what's the best place to go? Uh, if you're on Instagram, it's going to be at Bam Lionheart. Okay. Check out some of my videos. Send me a message if you want to contact me. If you're looking for some longer videos, um, some educational, free educational material, or even some follow along movement practices and workouts, check out my YouTube, which is at Primal Movement. And then if you're interested in um, some educational materials, I've got some online courses of the basic 
movements, primal movements of the body that keep us healthy. If you're looking for that framework like we talked about, go to primalmovement.org. Um, and there's going to be some ways that you could either work with me online or you can get yourself some nice e-courses so you can have some good understanding and some applicable ways to incorporate this in your life. Awesome. So I will put all those in the uh, show notes so that people can find you easily. Um, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, absolutely wonderful. And so thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, Ryan. It's been good.